Uh, thanks everyone for being here on the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, you're definitely going to have a leg up over your classmates who chose not to come because uh, this is going to be difficult-ish stuff. So, and we're building on it for next Monday. So, uh, first, any questions? Project five, other stuff? Any answer? Yeah. On the extra credit, is it all or none? No. Okay. It's like the other ones. Okay. You're going to want like a quarter of five points. Yeah. Hey, if that's all you can get. I mean, better than zero, I guess. You're not going to include like any error cases where you put like variables inside the body that aren't inside the definition. No. So every program you're going to get is well formed. Okay. Just like all the examples. Okay. So if you think that's not the case, then say something. Yeah. Come back. Oh, what's the deadline for submitting project Same day as project five submission. So same day and time. So what's that next? A week at midnight. Other questions? You have your hand up. We're not having homework six. Uh, homework six. There'll be a homework on lambda calculus, just because it's going to be on the final. So you want to do a homework on it first. Uh, not sure yet. It'll probably be after to give you some breathing room between project and homework. Obviously, so sometime between project five and before midterm. So that way you can get the answer, the answers back, and everything. And that should be good. Uh, yeah. Uh, black shirt. Did you just, uh, did you say, uh, we're getting our test back to before we get? You should, yeah. We want to have the test midterms graded by Wednesday. So hopefully that happens. Otherwise, if not, we'll figure out some way to get all 200 of your tests to you. <laughs> yes. Are we going to have a refined sheet study guys? Uh, no. We already have midterm one, midterm two. The only difference is going to be the lambda calculus, which we'll have the homework on, so it doesn't really make sense. Okay. Anything else? No project five questions? Like seven of you in office hours, and nobody has any questions? Because it's easy and everybody's done, right? Okay. Rather, it's the holidays and we're ready for it. What? <laughs> You're going to work on it really hard in the next week? Good. And you've been working very hard on it? Great. OK, so we're back at lambda calculus. right? So what did we say? What's a free variable in lambda calculus? <coughs> like without defining it, it's like an informal definition. Yeah? Say louder. Uh, yeah. So it's not it's not inside of an abstraction. It doesn't. It's not inside of a body with a meta variable of the same name, right? So it means so it's not uh, it's not referred to by any of the uh, of the abstractions. Um, let's go full on review. So what are what are the three different forms that a lambda expression can be in? What was it? Yeah. Which is what? Or expression, expression. Expression, 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 space, expression. Yeah. <laughs> what did we call that? Did we give that a name yet? No. Okay, good. Application. Application, yeah. Good. Okay, what's the next one? Yeah. Parentheses, expression, those parentheses. All right. Parentheses, that's like the easy one. Yes. <laughs> so parentheses to force uh, grouping. Yes. Good. Yeah, lambda variable dot expression, what do we call that? What was it? An abstraction, yeah, also a function, but uh, the lambda calculus term is an abstraction. And there's a fourth one. Expression goes to ID. Yeah, expression goes to ID, which is just an, some kind of variable, right? Cool, all right, look at this. All this knowledge retained in the span of two days. Very good. Okay, so what does it mean for x to be free in an expression? What are the rules we have here? So what about, so how many different rules do we need? At least four, right? We need, an expression can be in one of four forms, right? 
We can drop the parentheses because who really cares? Um, it doesn't really matter for semantic purposes except for grouping an expression together, right? So we have three things, cases. So what about if, if uh, the expression is the ID x? Would that mean x is free or not free? Yes? Yeah, it means that x is free, right? So if the expression is just the identifier x, then x is free in this expression, right? Why? Yeah, it's not, it's not inside any abstractions, exactly. OK, what if, what if the expression is of the form lambda, let's say another variable y, epsilon 1, or e1, sorry. What was it? It is free, it's a different name. Yeah, so, it's it, so we need to check, right? So we're going to recurse. So the, kind of the rule is, OK, well, if the expression is an abstraction, and the meta variable of that abstraction is not the variable we're interested in, then we have to look inside that expression to see if there's a free variable called x. Um, for, uh, wait, is this, did we go over this? I feel like we, oh, we did not go over this. Oh, because we started here. Ah, OK, this makes more sense. Uh, that's why that sentence isn't finished. That's weird. OK. Uh, OK. Cool. OK, so we've been looking at, so this is actually where we stopped with all the examples. Sorry about that. Um, we already went over these. We talked about which ones are free and which ones are not. So these are the definitions that I thought we were reviewing, but instead you guys actually derived them very well. So um, <laughs> that's even better on your part. Maybe I'll do this every time. OK, so variable x is free if expression is x, right? Um, if it's just an identifier and that identifier has the same name as the variable we're interested in, bam, it's free. Um, if we have an abstraction and the meta variable is not named the same thing as the, the variable we're interested in, and x is free in E1, then x is free, right? So this means we're actually recursing into Epsilon, uh, to E1, sorry, epsilons. Uh, somebody asked me questions at office hours about first and follow sets, and I've got like epsilons and lambdas mixed into my brain, and it's very weird. Okay. So, huh, this is not complete. I could drive it, I could look it up. Uh, let's. Put it on the back burner. Um, okay, let's say, okay, so it's pretty clear if it's an application, right, this third rule. So if an expression is an application, then we say, well, if x is free in E1, then x is free, right, which is what we've seen. So if it's free in basically either of these E1 or E2, then we know that it's free. Um, huh, it's going to bug me. I remember this. Okay, so we have E. So here we're saying x is free in E2. Yeah, x is free. Yeah, that makes sense. I think these are the only rules. I'm not really sure what this end every occurrence of is supposed to be. Right, so if it's an application, it, if it's free in either the left or the right, then x, the variable is free. Right? Which makes sense. So everybody see how these definitions are recursive? Right? So how do we tell if x is free in E1? If it fits any of the other rules, right? So we can pull it apart and keep on recursing, just like we say, hey, x is free in E1 here in an application, or x is free in E2. Uh, super simple. So I guess the one case here that's not stated, right, is when x is not free, because we're trying to determine if x is free. So what would be the case where x is not a free variable? Yeah? When it follows lambda and is an ex the expression. Yeah, so exactly. So when the meta variable is named x, then we know x is not free in that expression e1. Exactly. Yeah, does that make sense? No, because clearly that's the definition of free variables. OK, fairly simple. All right, let's look at some concepts. So is x free in this lambda expression? Yeah. 
Yes, no, maybe. That's yes. Why? It's free because if you look at that, the one where it was E and E, if it's hit free in one, then it's free in them all. Right, so how do you parse this? What's the first topmost expression? X. Uh, e. Which are the rules? Yeah, E, E, right? So this is an application. So it's X and then lambda X dot X, right? And that in itself is an expression, which has an inner expression of X. So yeah, exactly, exactly just from applying those rules, right? We can easily do this. So we say, okay, here's the whole thing. How do I know if X is free here? Well, if X is free in here, then that means X must be free in either of these expressions on the left and on the right. And then the left one is just the ID X. And we know that, that is, uh, that's good, so that, um, that is free there, yeah? What does it mean for X to be free? What does it mean? What does it mean? What's the, uh, what's the implication? Ah, we're, good. we're getting there. We're building up. So we're building up our base of some terms that we need so that we can use them to define basically computation. So it, it means that it's not in the body of a lambda that has the same meta variable, right? Yeah, the definition you had earlier, I'm just having trouble figuring out how the rules apply based on where we're going. Ah, ah, ah. Um, it should be clearer, but let's see. Okay. I can wait. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Something like an unused variable? How would you define unused? But if it's defined somewhere else, does that mean it's unused? Yeah, so that's, so kind of, I guess the sneak peek, it's kind of like a global variable in some sense. So it's defined somewhere outside of this function. Is one way to think about it, but. So if it's looking at the rules so they apply independently, so mm -hmm. if x is free in one of them and not, say it's free in E1, then we're good? Yeah, so this is the important thing is, um, we're just talking about the name X. So there could be, X could appear multiple times. It could be, it could be um, in multiple meta variables that all have the same name X. So, exactly. So all we're saying is, is the name X free? At some point. Exactly, at anywhere in this expression. Okay. Cool. Okay, is X free in this expression? Yes. Lambda X dot X Y, X. Yeah, right, because it's free in the right expression. So everybody see kind of how, you, well, the body here is only x, y, right? So this is y. So this x in here is not free. Yeah, we'll get into that in a second. OK, is x free here? Yes? x is free? Why is x free? If I were to add parentheses here, where would I add the parentheses to make to disambiguate this? What was that? After the Y. Ah. Where would I add the left parentheses? Oh, before the lambda. Before the lambda. And after the Y. No. Before so the we'll, Y and after the X in the outer. Right, because the body, remember, so application is left associative. Right? So in that case, we group things to the left. But here, the body extends as far as possible, as far as it can. So here, this body right, is going to extend and capture both of those things here. So this, this is one of the times where the disambiguation rules really help us figure out, is this a free variable or not? Right? Because here, if, x, if y and x are part of the body, then it's, is it x free or not free? Not free. Not free, exactly. So yeah. Correct. No, no, no. It is because this x, so the body uh, extends as far right as possible, but can it extend past this parentheses? No, but there is an x inside the body. Right, which is not free, but is there, so when you're talking about a whole expression, you just want to see is there any occurrence of x that is free? Yeah, so it was uh, like an any check, basically. Yeah. So in the second one, if you had it explicitly put the parentheses, we would have put the parentheses, the x, y, and the x. Exactly. So getting rid of this parent these parentheses here, 
means that the body of this abstraction is x, x, y, x, which would be x, y grouped together, after applied first, and then that applied to x in the larger one. And that would make x not free. Correct. Exactly. Awesome. Anything else? That's good. OK. The free is really, really awesome. Um, we're talking about a concept here. We're going like, to define it here, and then we're going to go back to it later because it's very cool and very important. Um, combinators. So a combinator is an expression that does not have any free variables. Right? So if we think of this kind of like a function, right? it would be a function that define, refers to no global variables. Right? So it's kind of self-contained. It's also another way that they use to describe it is called closed. It's a closed expression because everything you need to know about that function is right there. Pretty simple, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so is this a combinator? Yes. yes. The question to ask yourself is are there any free variables, right? Is this a combinator? Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, is this a combinator? Why not? Why is free? Why is free? Good. Uh, anybody heard the term combinator in another context? What was it? I was kidding. I said why combinator. I was kidding. Why? Why are you kidding? Where have you heard that term before? It's a incubator. Yeah. So there's a famous, uh, really famous, actually, incubator in Silicon Valley called Y Combinator. Right. So uh, the, the name comes from this, from combinators from Lambda Calculus. And that's actually one of the really cool things I want to get into is what is the Y Combinator. So uh, we'll look at that later because it's super awesome. But that's why I wanted to find it here. So you may think, ah, it's like a crazy theoretical term. But you know, I guess you could say smart people think, it, think that it's cool and important too. So yeah. Help me clarify. Could yes. You, could you do the parentheses? Uh, could I? Would it just point oh. where they are? Uh, so so are in this. Yeah, in this expression, right? So you would have the body of this uh, lambda x abstraction starts here, and where does it end? At the very end, right? Past this last x. And then this y, the body of this abstraction starts here, and where does it extend? Yeah, exactly, right before the last one. Exactly. So this one would just be here, if you're going to put it, right? Um, same thing here. So the body would start after uh, the before this lambda, after this period, right of this body of this abstraction uh, with z. And where would it extend to? The end. the end after z, exactly. And the same thing with this inner lambda x. Yeah? So inside of the x, y, z, mm -hmm. which ones are grouped first, x and y? What's the rule? Left ones first, right? Yeah, they're left associated. So x and y are grouped first. Exactly. Yep. All right. Awesome. Cool. OK. So now I have to say, what's the opposite of a free variable? Not so, free variable? Not free, yes. <laughs> would be one way to put it. Uh, what we're going to use is the term bound variable. So you got to think like this variable is bound to a specific abstraction. So uh, it's very easy. Uh, if it's not free, it's a bound variable. Variables only have two. They're either bound or free. But the real question is, what abstraction are they bound by? Right? So this would be, you kind of think of, um, really one way to think about this is scoping, right? So what's the scope of this variable's usage? Right? So you kind of want to think about uh, which, like a function, like we've been talking about with scoping rules, right? So we have a, a variable usage. How do we trace that back to where that variable was defined? Here we don't have local variables. The only thing we have are function parameters, right? Because we know how to how to then reference. Questions on bound variables? Okay. So we have some rules, even though it's actually pretty straightforward, right? So if it's not free, then it's bound. But the real question here is answering: Well, what abstraction binds that that variable? Let's look. OK. So if an occurrence of x is free in an expression e,
then it's bound by lambda x in lambda x dot e. Right? So if x is free in e, then what does that mean? take that same expression, right, and we add a lambda x around it, put that as the body of an abstraction with the meta variable of name x, now we know that x is now bound in E, is now bound by that lambda ex expression, right? So x was free, no abstraction was binding it, so if we put an abstraction with the name x, then we know that x is bound by this abstraction. That make sense? Not seeing a lot of nodding. Okay, so now we're saying basically this rule says, hey, if we swap out, if we have an expression e that's bound by a particular lambda x, which is inside e somewhere, and we say if we take that same expression and we just throw a lambda z around it, that doesn't change x's binding. Right? Pretty simple. So it doesn't matter what abstraction you put on it, right? It's still going to refer to whatever um, whatever referred to. Uh, note that the really important thing is even if z is the same name as x. So what concept is this of scoping that we've been talking about? Pass by value. Pass by value. No. Yeah. What was that? Name equivalence. No. That's by reference, no. Scoping, scoping rules, yeah. Dynamic scoping, uh, no. Close. I feel like we'll get there eventually, right? Yeah? Static scoping, it is a form of static scoping, but specifically what is this doing? Shadowing, yeah, exactly. So basically this says, hey, if x is already bound to a particular abstraction, if you put another abstraction over it with the same name x, it still refers to that inner scoping, right? So just because there's an external x in a larger scope, the reference of x refers to the closest innermost abstraction. So for instance, in this case, right? So we have the statement lambda x, the body of that is lambda x, and the body of that is x. Right? So which lambda expression binds x? Second. The second one. Yeah, right? And we can see that these rules apply. Right? So if we got rid of the outer lambda x and just thought about this inner one as an expression, does this first rule hope? Is this does this first rule hold? Is x free in this expression? No. No, because it's bound by an expression. It's not a free variable. So that means if we just add a lambda x, that doesn't change anything. Right? So you can think about this first rule kind of says the innermost expression is going to be what binds x. Right? Because that's when x is free. So if we look at this body in here, is x free here? Sure. Yes. Right there. Just, yeah. the just this body, the inner one. Yes. Yeah. X is free in here. Right? Which means we put a lambda x in front of it, and that means this lambda x binds this x. And now that we have this binding, it doesn't matter what other things we add. The second rule just said it doesn't matter what, what you add outside or abstract, what more abstractions you add over that, that x is always going to be bound to this lambda expression. So this binding is just like scoping resolution, right? So it's saying, hey, I have this free x that I don't know what it is. How do I find out? Well, you keep going up abstractions until you find the first lambda x that defines it. Yeah? Can you walk through where you've seen that expression? Uh, not yet. Okay. We're not there yet. We have other things to learn first. Yes. So does that mean that any x, that x has to be defined somewhere as a lambda x in this recursive? Say that again? Does that mean that x has to, be, has to have a lambda x that's somewhere in the recursive chain if you've got an x? 
No, no, no. The only if for it to be bound, yes. Okay. So for an expression to be bound, there has to be some for a variable to be bound, there has to be some abstraction that has the same name as that variable. Otherwise it's free. So right, so deciding if it's free or bound is very easy. We have all gone through, we can decide if it's free, right, very easily. And then, so if it's not free, then it must be bound. So then the question is, how do you know which lambda abstraction binds it? That's just like static scoping rules, right? So you look at the abstraction one level out, and if that's not the same name, then you look two levels out, three levels out, until you finally find what abstraction it refers to. Anything else? Okay, there's one more. Oh, wait. Somebody said one. Uh, okay, so there's one more rule, which basically just says, hey, if you have, if x is bound by an abstraction in E1, then it doesn't matter if application doesn't change anything, right? It doesn't matter if you're applying an E2 or you're applying E1 to E2. That doesn't affect the binding scoping rule. just about the body of an abstraction, right? So can a body of an abstraction span two applications? No. To me, really, this is almost superfluous because it's, it's only talking about the body of an abstraction, right? So a body of an abstraction can't span across two applications because it's an expression, right? So, uh, so yeah, so if you have a variable x that's bound, it doesn't matter if you, what, what, what happens on the applications, they don't affect each other in terms of binding. All right, let's look at some examples. OK. So which variables bind to what? Free, everything that x, everything y, so that means everything is free, right? 
So then let's look at these two, these two. So we can look at them in isolation. Uh, remember, these are application, right? But uh, we know that application doesn't affect the binding. So we can look and see, OK, let's look at this x. Is x free? Yes. 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 Is it covered by an abstraction? No. no. So that means it's not bound. It's just a free variable. What about this y? It's free. Yeah. So these occurrences of x and y are free variables, right? Whereas these occurrences of x and y are bound. And each of them are bound to different abstractions. So if we were to color it, well, I don't want to color it, but um, that's not fair to people who are colorblind. Uh, but so I underlined every variable that was free. And I bolded the variables that are all with this abstraction, right? all of these x's. And I italicized all the y's, all the variables that are bound to that abstraction. Right? So this would be something that could be asked on a test. Right? Mm -hmm. So could you say that even though an overall expression is not a combinator, it's made up of combinators? Mm. Uh, is an expression made up of expressions? Is it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, so. Convince yourself one way or the other. Yes. <laughs> yes. Then yeah. Then exactly. So if the whole thing is a combinator, then maybe the inner thing is a combinator, right? But here you have the innermost is this, which has a free variable, so it's not a combinator. Exactly. Yeah, so what would happen if we change this lambda y to be lambda x? How would that change things? X would be bound. Y yes, in the front. X would be bound to that x, and then the y's would become This bound. x? Uh, to the lambda x that we changed, to the one we changed. This x would be bound here? No, the one right next to it. This x? So this one would be bound here, right, and not the outer lambda. So this is kind of the shadowing principle, right? So essentially the. The inner abstraction lambda x shadows the outer lambda x. Um, and then what happens to these y's? They're free. Free. They become free variables, right? Because there's no abstraction that contains them. Yeah, good question. Yeah? What happens to it? So we don't know yet, but. Uh, right now, you can kind of think of we're defining the scoping rules of variables in our, in our functions. So we need to define those because we need to know what, because that affects how we actually compute and resolve things, kind of. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, so, you mean this was lambda x? Yeah. So the question is, so remember we actually, when we first looked at this, right, we looked at the x, y, z, y as an expression, and we said, what are the free variables in here? What are the free variables? So I'm going to say again, what are the free variables in here? Uh, when, when is lambda x? Or when no, no, no. So we're not, remember we don't even look at anything outside. We say just the body, just this body expression, which variables are free? All of them, exactly. So it doesn't matter the abstraction that's outside of it, right, until we want to say what binds it. Right? So even if this is a lambda x, the body inside the body, x is still free. Yeah, so you think you're just looking at that thing in isolation by like blocking out everything else but that expression. So you say, is x free there? The answer is yes, and it doesn't matter what abstraction is outside of it. All right, let's look at another example. So what's bound to what? And what variables are free? What was that? The right x is free? And what about, what about everything else? What is this x bound to? The 
first subtraction that's on here, what are this y? The second. The second, the second and the z? Yeah. This one. Yeah. Boom, right? So the x and x is bound to that x and that lambda expression, or that uh, lambda abstraction. This y is bound to this y, and the z's are bound to z's, and this x is a free x. Free x. Okay. What about this? Z is free. What is this x bound to? The inner one. The inner one, this one? 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 Yeah. I like it. Awesome. Okay, so this is bound to this. What about this x? First one. Yeah, the first one. Good. So we have these x's are bound together, these x's are bound. But this x is bound to this abstraction, this x is bound to this abstraction, and z is free. Okay. How do we tell if two functions are equivalent? Same. Same number of arguments. Same number of arguments. Same return type. Ah, uh, that's only about type equivalence, though, right? Does that mean the actual functions themselves are equivalent? What was it? Same body. same body. Yeah, so maybe if they're like literally identically the same, right? But so that could be one way, right, to determine functional if two functions are equivalent. If they have the exact same bodies, then they should be the same. Yeah. If they do the same thing. If they do the same thing, what is that? What would that? So if, if they uh, return the same values for all inputs and have Yeah, so that would be one way. So that would be, I guess we're doing it at like two complete ends of the spectrum, right? So one end would be, well, they, uh, they're either exactly textually identical, right? And the other end is more semantic, right? They are or semantically equivalent or they do the same thing given the same input for all inputs and have the same side effect. Uh, can we do the first one? Yes, please, yes. You can compare two things, right? To tell me if they're exactly the same. Yes, you could do that. Can we do the other one? No. A lot more difficult? How much more difficult? I think you can just compare the outputs of the two. You compare the outputs of the two functions? How do you generate all possible inputs? So like, let's say they take in integers. So you're going to generate every single integer starting at zero and going out, how do you know when to stop? Yeah? Maybe if you can reduce the, the expression to be equal to the same thing? You can reduce the expression to be equal to the same thing? Uh, in lambda calculus, reduction is more of like an execution thing, so that would be, you'd still have to give it input, right? So you have to apply it to something, but you have to apply both functions to the same thing, make sure they have the same result, but it have to be for every single thing you apply it to, it's the same thing, yeah? Yeah, the same thing. Uh, oh, structural. Oh, the order doesn't matter. Structural equivalence, like the equivalent in this domain is structural equivalence. Yeah, so maybe they're structurally equivalent. I like that, I like that. Can you only compare the inputs outputs if uh, the input is a finite set, because uh, as long as the input is not a finite set, So let's say, let's think about it, right? So let's say we, even if it was five numbers, what happens if the function is looping forever on one of those five numbers? Or it seems, do we know if it's going to loop forever? Maybe that's just what it's doing, right? Do we not know if we need to keep it, have it keep executing for longer, right? So I think even that way, you'd still get into problems. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if that's, equivalent to the halting problem or not, that the two functions have exactly the same output given the same input. I kind of intuitively think so, but I, I don't know. I don't know a proof of that. So let's go back to this concept. So structural equivalent. So what did it mean for two functions to be structurally equivalent? They have the same 
have the same logic. What was it? Same logic. Same logic. Yeah, what was the other one? Same operations. What about those operations? Yeah. I'm just going to go with the same number, same bound, number of bound variables. Uh, yeah, same number of variables. Yeah, definitely. Look. If you can have same patch trees for both functions. The same what? Same patch trees that means that I can do. I didn't hear the word. Was parsing trees. Basically. Ah, parsing trees. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's so, so that's their have the same operators. Parse tree would be they have the same operators kind of in the same order. That's kind of what I would think of that. Uh, how do you, but could you make a program that has the same parse trees that are semantically different? Like how do you compare the parse trees? Because if you compare them directly, right, if I say, Think about assignment, right? If I have A is equal to A plus B, right? How do I compare that to, what if I have B is equal to C plus D? If I compare that textually, right, to make sure, okay, it's got the same parse tree and the same nodes with the same values, then I'm basically doing textual representation, right? So how do I compare the trees to know that they're the same? Was that see if the logics are consistent? How'd you do that? What was that? See if the binding, what do you mean? So if you have B is equal to C plus D, is you know B the same as A? Like what is the rest of the question? Yeah, so right, one bad thing is um, yeah, so we just compared the A plus B and B plus C. It depends on, I think, to the lambda calculus, right? Where are those B's and C's bound to the same abstraction, right? So yeah, let's let's take this a little bit forward, right? So, um, are these two functions functionally equivalent? Yes. Yes. So do they pass our test that we created, or let's say we use our functional equivalent as a structural equivalent? We'll give it a name in a second, but. So what's the two? What's the difference between these two functions? You, yeah, you're the one who said who came up with the thing. So, well, not just different letters, right? They have different variables, and specifically, they have different variables with the specific name, with that are the bound the uh, variables in the abstraction here, right? So yeah, so if we replace all the y's with x's, then we have same function, right? What about this? <coughs> are these the function are functional slash structural equivalent? Some people nodding their head. Why? Had some method to make the order of the variables, you know, the same. So you have kind of the same appearance of the x's and appearance of the y's. If we kind of abstracted them up, to the same value. That would be equivalent. Wait, say that again. Uh, so the x's and the y's appear. It has the same format. They appear in kind of the same order. So if there's some way just to take the actual names out of it and make them make the names named by order of appearance or something, then they they seem to be equivalent because they're both variable names. Not communicating with variable. I'm trying to think. Maybe. Let's go back to this one, actually. Now that I look at it in a new light, I see it both ways. Uh, I'm not really sure. Let's see. OK, this one should be very easy, right? Yes. Equivalent? Awesome. OK. OK, so alpha, so what we're going to use, we're going to use, uh, they, there's a term in lambda calculus called alpha 
alpha equivalence, which essentially defines the structural equivalence that we've been talking about. Um, so the definition is uh, the kind of intuitive way to think about it is alpha equivalence is when two variables or two functions vary only by the names of the bound variables, right? Which kind of goes back to the hey, let's just if we replace if we change the variable names, then we will get the same function, right? So it's still functionally it still uh, does the same logic, but so does this match our ideal of having two functions equivalent if they produce the same output given the same input? What was it? Not quite. Why? Yeah, exactly, right? I, all of you are proof of this, right? So you submit programming assignments that you can think of as functions that take in input and give output, right? So they're all doing the same, all of your programs depending on where you are, but let's say you get 100%, right? You're all doing the same thing. You're, you're writing functions that given the same input produce the same output, but you're doing it in such a way that all the, the body of the function, everything is very different, right? Depending on your logic. Otherwise, we have problems, right? So it's a good, good proof. OK, so we're going to use this term uh, alpha equivalent. So expression 1 is an alpha equivalent to expression 2. Um, and this is what we mean by this, is that two functions vary only by the names of the bound variables. But the problem is, what we really want is we need a way to rename variables in an expression. Right? So can we do just like a simple find and replace? No. Why? Because it might be bounded at different levels. Right, because we have to respect the, bound, the binding of the variable to the abstraction, right? So what about like this example? Can we rename x to foo? Can we? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, that's what we can, right? We can just rename x to foo. What about y? Can we rename it to bar? Yes. Yeah. Can we rename y to x? <laughs> no, good call, but no, from this, too many things to keep in your head. So why can't we rename y to x, given this original statement that we have here? Yeah? Because then x would be bound to the x in the second line. Yeah, so this, this x would then be bound to this x here, and now we have a different function with different logic, right? Can we rename x to z? Why? What was that? Z is free, so how's that going to change our function? Yeah, it's now referencing a bound variable, right? So a variable that was free that's now bound. So now we've definitely changed the semantics of the function. Cool. So this is what we have to do: is we have to we're defining this renaming operator that's going uh, that's going to help us to rename, and so that way we can say that two things are alpha equivalent if we can rename all bound variables such that they're the same. Okay, so this operation we're going to use, so we have, we'll hint forward, so we're doing this very simple variable renaming, so part of the, sem so the semantics here is we're going to represent this with E or some lambda expression, and then curly braces, Y over X, so this means replace all occurrences of X with Y. So what are the types of X and Y, using of types? What was it? ID. IDs, yeah, exactly. That's the important thing here about renaming. We're only renaming variables. So uh, we can't, so X and Y can't be arbitrary lambda expressions here in renaming because we just want to rename one variable to another name. Cool. Okay, what are the three expression cases that we need to take care of? What was it? We said something. Yeah. Expression, expression. What's the next one? Expression equals ID. Expression ID. Lambda ID. Yeah. Lambda ID. Lambda meta variable body, essentially, right? So we need to do that. So we need to handle all these cases. 
Okay, so the expression, so we're gonna do this like we did before, right? I thought you already knew this. So if the expression is x, then what's the result of applying a renaming operation on this renaming operation on x? Why? Why? Exactly. So if it's the thing we're looking for, if it's x, then change it to y. What if it's something else? What if it's z? Mm -hmm. mm, I'm gonna speak beyond. <laughs> That would be z. Yeah, exactly. We don't change it, right? So uh, if the expression is z or some anything else that's not an x, any other id that's not an x, and we say we just it stays the same, right? Because we're trying to replace what? X, x with y. Exactly. OK. As far as to like why x is on the bottom and y is on the top of this thing, I have no idea. This is just the convention. So just got to learn it. Okay, what about, what do we do in the case of application? So we have expression one, expression two. Ask the question again. So this E is of the form expression one applied to expression two, right? E1 space E2. So we want to apply this renaming operation to E1 and E2. Exactly, right? Super simple. We just want to apply it to E1 and apply it to E2. Okay. Now, what's, so now we get to the abstractions, right? So we have lambda, so we have lambda ID expression. So what are probably, you can maybe see there's kind of a similarity here between the cases that we're trying to define here. So what are some of the, the cases that we care about for the ID, the meta variable of an abstraction? What was that? Yeah. We don't change the number of bound and unbound variables in the body. Uh, say that again? You don't change the number? True. Um, so more looking at these cases, right? So this is saying like, hey, so the first case we have expression goes to an ID. And so the two cases here are either the ID is X or the ID is not X. Right? These are these two cases. So in this third case, the next thing we have to deal with is the lambda abstraction, right? So, um, so we have to somehow propagate this renaming operation into the body. What are the two cases we care about? X is free or X is bound? Uh, X exists in kind of. Or X doesn't exist in the expression? Uh, kind of. Uh, <laughs> actually, okay, let's look at this. So, yeah, okay. So, um, if it's a lambda expression, right, and the meta variable is X, then, so, okay, I guess I should step back a little bit. Uh, this renaming operation is very simple, so it just does renaming. So basically replace every occurrence of x with y. Uh, we're going to do other things on top of it that are smarter, that take in these things into account. So basically it says, hey, if the meta variable is x, then change that to y and apply the renaming operation to the body. So what if uh, the meta variable is not x, if it's some, something else? What was it? Yeah. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. Well, except pass it through, right? Exactly. So we covered all the cases. Can expression be in any other form? So what are the three forms, right? So we have ID, Done. we have application, and we have abstraction, Done. right? So here we have two cases for ID, one where x the ID is X, and one where the ID is not X. And here we have the other case, we have two cases, one where the meta variable is X, and one where the meta variable is not X. Right, so with those, what is that, five cases? I better count quickly. Uh, so those five cases, right, those 
we know that those cover all of our cases here. Pretty easy, right? Change every current x to y. OK, let's look at some examples. Let's look at this. So we want to apply lambda x dot x. First thing, is this expression a combinator? Yes. Why? No free variables. No free variables, exactly. So what are we replacing? Are we replacing foo with x? X with foo, exactly. So we apply this here. What's the first step? What are we doing? What are we changing? Yeah, so we're changing this x here to be foo. And then we're doing the body of that. We're going to pass this renaming operation. And then we're going to apply this renaming operation to the uh, expression x. And what's that going to change? X to foo. X to foo. Boom. So we've renamed x to foo in this, uh, in this expression. OK, this is a little hard one. This is the one we've already seen, so it's not so crazy. I mean, it's crazy, but it's not so crazy, right? Just, just wait. Uh, OK, so here we're changing every bar to x, or every, well, every x to bar, exactly. OK, so what's the outer level? What type of expression is that? Body. The outer? The outermost, the topmost expression? Application. Yeah, exactly. So it's application. So we're going to apply, basically we're going to pass bar x to eat everything in the application. So I've done that to this one, this one, and this one, right? Uh, so then it's going to, we can apply it wherever we want to first. Let's say first we apply it to y. What happens to y? Nothing. Nothing. And then we're going to apply it to x. What happens to x? Bar. Changes to bar. And then we apply this to this abstraction. So what's going to change here? What was that? Yeah, so this x is going to get changed uh, to bar. And then we're going to apply this to an application, which we apply it to uh, each. Did I do that? The here and here. Yeah, I've already applied it to this x and this x. And then we apply it to the inner one. Uh, it doesn't change the y, and then so we apply it to the inner one, this bar x. So it's going to end up changing this x to bar, and here we replace all x's with bars. Seems pretty simple, right? So this t this replacement doesn't, yeah. If we take in the two parentheses on the outside out, so that I mean it subtly changes it. Yes. It frees, it frees the, the x on the end, so there would be no replacement on that x, just to clarify. On which x? This x? Yeah. If we remove those two outer parentheses because it would no longer be bound. Uh, oh, is this x bound? No, it's free. It's free, it's free in this one. It is free. Yeah, so this, oh, this renaming operation is just changes all the names. Exactly. So we're defining this simple operator, and then we're going to do things with it that are better, basically, to keep that in the Yeah, there's a hand. Why don't we go and greedy textual infrastructure models? I can't hear you. Why don't we go and greedy textual infrastructure models? Why don't we do a what? A greedy textual infrastructure models. Ah, essentially that's what we're doing, right? But you have to define it, right? It has to be defined of how to, how to do that for every single, and how to transform every possible uh, expression. Right, so that's why we're defining all these things very precisely so we can see exactly what this operator means and what it does. All right, so now we go to alpha equivalents. OK, so what we're going to find is that two expressions are alpha equivalent if for all expressions in E, right, so OK. This is a general definition. So for all expressions E, so any expression you can think of, right? Think of this like logic. For all E, uh, for all variables Y that do not occur in E, um, if we take E and it's abstracted over X, this is alpha equivalent to lambda Y expression replacing X with Y. OK. 
right? So if we take, so basically, just this just does exactly what we thought and what we wanted to do is, hey, if we replace the bound variable and we change it to something else and change that inside, then those two things are alpha equivalent. So is alpha y dot y, oops, I should have added the alpha there, alpha equivalent to lambda x dot x? Yes. Yes, why? Right, so we can take, so E here is this expression Y. And if we take Y, so this would be lambda Y dot Y, and we can make a new expression by substituting Y with X, then we get an equivalent expression. So basically this statement says, hey, if you, Y in this expression, if you can take any abstraction over any variable, as long as we place that y with whatever you want, those are um, alpha equivalent. What about this? So this defines alpha equivalence of functions, right? Because or abstractions. Because we don't care if two applications are, you know, we don't really care if two IDs are functionally equivalent, right? We care about, because that's what we were talking about, right? We were talking about how do we define functional equivalence. Um, so yeah, here this defines that an abstraction over a variable P, if we change that abstraction variable to be whatever we want, then that's alpha equivalent to the right hand side. No, why no? Uh, y, Z, and then Y, X. So if you changed all the Ys, it would turn out to be functionally equivalent. Just by that definition, if I replace all the Ys, yeah, so that's actually a really good point. Uh, so this would actually definitely be no because this is an application, right? So E here is like this whole thing. Is this whole thing in the form lambda something dot E? No. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that would definitely not make these function equivalent. Um, let's look. What if we get rid of the x, y, and the y, x and just compare these inner functions? Just that rule, no. Just that rule, no. Why? Because we don't have a way to replace C and W. Yeah. Right? Because we're only replacing bound variables. Exactly. Okay, good. This does go to answer our, convince myself. This does go to answer our earlier question, right? So Z here, is Z bound or free? Free. 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 Right? So this says, hey, you can change any bound variable to point to, to be a different name, right? But z is not bound here, so we can't change that to be another name. So these expressions are not alpha equivalent. Good. That makes sense, right? It makes sense, right? Because if you have a function that references a global variable, and you have another function that references a global variable with a different name, now you can't really tell these functions are not necessarily the same because depending on the context that they're ran in could have different results, right? But if they at least reference the same global variable, then you could say they're functionally equivalent because they have the same operations and they just vary based on the parameter name. some examples. Okay. Good. Okay. 
So we have to do one more thing, right? So, okay, so renaming gets us almost all the way there. We can change things, but we, we already saw, well, changing things, changing names, right, just willy-nilly. So here, this we're only ever changing bound variables, right? So that's fine, because we're never gonna accidentally change a free variable, uh, nothing like that, right? We're only ever changing bound variable names. So, hey. Um, okay, so we need something else because we, we saw that there's cases where you want to change a name, but maybe that's going to mess up the resulting function, right? So what we're going to define is a new operator called substitution, and this is going to be everything we're going to need on Monday. We're going to go through the actual execution semantics or the reductions, uh, but we first have to define this operator. Uh, it's called substitution. So uh, what was the end goal example that we were talking about that we wanted to be able to reduce or compute from lambda calculus? They look exactly the same. They look exactly the same. So yes, so we want, what we want to do, right, our goal that we're taking, what we really want to go to, is we want to take, uh, be able to reduce or compute, really, a function, uh, sorry, not a function, application. So here we have lambda x dot plus x1. Right, this is the example I use. And if we apply that to two, right, really what we're doing is this, when we reduce this, we want to, oh sorry, this, this is supposed to be an arrow. It got a little messed up on the lines here. Um, what we're doing is really replacing all the x's with the parameter, two, right? So that's what we want here, which is plus one, two. So really what we want to do is replace x with expression two. Uh, but can we use renaming? We just renamed all x's to twos. No. No. Like in this simple example, yes, but we've already seen cases where renaming completely changes the function meaning. So we definitely don't want to just do renaming. Uh, so we need another operator called substitution, which is what we're going to use to replace a variable, a variable by an expression. So the form of this is going to be different. So this is the way we can keep renaming and substitution distinct is that here we have an expression, and we're going to say replace the variable x with n. So the difference here is n is now a lambda expression. right? It can be any arbitrary lambda expression, whereas before, what was the, what could we use to replace in renaming? Just IDs. Just IDs, right, exactly. So here the type is ID replaced with an, an E, an expression. So then you can, once we have this, right, once we're able to replace a variable safely with an expression, then we can use that to, to reduce this application by replacing all of the two, all of the x's with twos, and now we've done some computation, as, as we'll see. Uh, you have to trust me, at least right now, to show that that actually is computation, but uh, this is where we're going, and this is why we need to define this new operator. Questions on the substitution operator? So yeah, it seems pretty simple. So this is kind of where we're going. We want to say, hey, if we have the expression plus x1, we want to replace x with 2. What do we do? Or we want to, sorry, substitute. We want to substitute x for 2. What do we do? Like intuitively, without thinking about it too much. Set x to be 2. Yeah, exactly. We're just replace x with 2. Bam. So we want to get plus 2, 1. What about in this case? So here I have a, an, ex, an abstraction of lambda dot plus x1. And I want to replace x with 2. Remember, you can only this can be an arbitrary expression, right? You can't replace the first one. Definitely can't replace the first one. Why? Because Following a lambda it has to be an ID. Mm -hmm. Can't replace. It can't be an expression. Exactly. Yeah. So so um, uh, you can't definitely can't replace this x, right? Because it has to be an ID from the syntax that we know. So you can just tap two on the back side. What was that? Like you would apply two to this function. Apply two to this function. 
Um, we'll see exactly how this works, but you know, here we want to think about substituting x of 2. What's the difference between this x here and this x here? Bound. Yeah, bound. This x is bound and this x is free. Right? So we can replace a free x with whatever expression we want. But here, we actually, there's nothing to substitute because x is already bound. So we actually can't go into that expression to, to reduce, to replace that x with something arbitrary. So you only can do substitution on free variables? Yes, which we'll get to. But I'm trying to build up some intuition. So when we look at the rules, they kind of make sense. They're not just arbitrarily handed down. OK, let's look at something that's slightly more complicated. So here I'm actually using, instead of 2, um, here I'm using so what we want to replace, we want to replace all occurrences of y with the expression lambda z dot xz. And our expression that we're replacing is lambda x dot yx. So, so does the first thing hold? Can I actually do this replacement? Yes, sort of. Yes. So if I replace this y with lambda z dot xz, is that okay? No, because it um, binds the x inside that function. Exactly. Everybody see that? So if we replace this in here, like this, right? Where is this x bound to now? Yeah, the first lambda. Where is this x bound here? It's not bound. It's a free variable. Exactly. So is this terrible? Does this mean that we can't apply this? Or can't do this substitution? Rename what? Yeah, so um, the way it's done is instead, so one thing we can do, to, well, can we rename the free variable x? Yes. Yes? Would that be an equivalent substitution? Shouldn't you had no, why? We can replace what? Right, we can replace bound variables without changing the, the semantics, right? But if we replace this x, well, if this is a free x, it may refer to something important, right? So if we change that, now it's to some other variable now, how do we know how to do that? Um, what about this x? Can we change this x? Yes. Ah, right? So we know how to do that. We saw the renaming operator. We can change this expression to something that's alpha equivalent by changing the x to be, what can we change it to? Can we change it to y? No. No, because that messes things up. What can we change it to? P. Hmm? Something, not Something not here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK, so we can just create a new variable, right? Because we, it doesn't matter as long as inside this body, all of those x's are changed to now w's. So we can do that. So here, this actually allows the substitution operator to, x to, to operate correctly. Um, and so, okay, so we'll, I guess not, we'll stop here. And maybe I'll assume that you all know this uh, before we go on. Um, but yeah, so anyways, we'll come back here on Monday. Thanks for coming.